Hi, so let's look at Byron's poems that you read for this unit. So you can see, like I did in the previous uh, videos, I've given you um, the poems and I've tried to scan them and um, written some themes on the, on the pages. So first one is She Walks in Beauty. This was written around 1815 and it was published in a collection called Hebrew Melodies. It is a lyric um, because again, it, it actually has been set to music many times. Um, but you can see in terms of the scansion, it is an iambic tetrameter. So iambic, she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, right? So that's that iambic, that heartbeat. And then we have four of those iambic feet in each line, right? And it is, it is very regular. It doesn't really um, much um, mess with that rhythm. Um, it is all alternating rhyme, A, B, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, C, D, and so on and so forth, right? Um, other things in terms of scansion is uh, the rhyme. There is what we call slant rhyme. So lant, slant rhyme is sometimes called near rhyme, close rhyme, imperfect rhyme. It's basically where you have um, words that either look like they should rhyme, but they don't. So they visually work it, or they may have... Um, uh, parts of the word that have uh, rhyming with each, another word, but it's not maybe the end sound, right? So here it's line 13 and 15, brow and glow is our slant rhyme, right? Um, this does have in jammed and in stop lines. So in stop lines are where the, the, the end of each line, there is some kind of natural pause, and it's usually indicated with some kind of punctuation mark, a period, a semicolon, a colon, sometimes even a comma. In jammed lines, do not stop at the end of the line, and you're supposed to you know, continue the thought on the next one. So when we read poetry, we say we read to punctuation. We don't read to the end of the line, right? So for example, the first, uh, the first line is in jammed, but the second line is in stopped, right? So she walks in beauty, like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. Thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies, right? So if this were in stopped, I would say she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, right? So in jammed versus in stopped, that's all that that, that means, right? We do have a possible inversion. So an inversion is where there's a substitution of a metrical foot, right, that breaks the regular pattern. And so I'm thinking on line four, we have a possible inversion. So we say, instead of meet in her aspect and her eyes, right, um, remember this is in stop, so we, uh, in jam, so we start on the, the line at the, the beginning line. And all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. I think the emphasis is going to be on meat when you say it, right? So, and right, meat in her aspect. So that's what we call an inversion, when you have just an odd metrical foot that breaks the pattern every once in a while, and it's quite common. Uh, I think uh, we've already seen a poem that does that, or we might see another one uh, here a little bit, and I'll point that out. In terms of stanzas, we have three sestets, right? A sestet is a quad, uh, stanza of six lines, right? Um, we do have simile, alliteration, and antithesis as some of the figurative language here. So a simile is she walks in beauty like the night, right? So we see uh, quite a few similes here. Alliteration is where you have that repetition of vowel sounds. So cloudless climbs and starry skies would be examples of alliteration. And antithesis is a rhetorical device where opposite um, things are put into close contrast with each other. And so in this poem, the two opposites that are done is uh, anything that's dark and bright. She's the best of dark and bright. Um, and so um, that is the antithesis that we see throughout this poem. You would think that uh, traditionally, beauty is something that is considered to be of the day, right? Um, not of the night where things are hidden and maybe dangerous and all that. But she has both, right? So if we look here at themes, then beauty, which is one of the really important themes that we see in Shelley Keats and Byron's poetry. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't beauty that's talked about in Wordsworth and Coleridge, but this is really kind of a second generation thing. And I'm not talking about beauty necessarily in terms of the way we automatically think about it as making yourself prettier. Beauty can mean, like you say here, I see, you see here down here in my little, uh, 
last little line here, how do we define beauty? And so when we read um, O to a Grecian urn, at the very end it says, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know, right? Well, what is beauty in that sense, right? So these different poems can be looking at beauty in a different way. But in this poem, it seems to be that her beauty comes from the harmony and the balance of light and dark that she uh, projects, right? That she's not just somebody who looks pretty on the outside, right? And she's not just someone who's only pretty on the inside. She has both, and that's the kind of beauty we want, something that is, is well balanced, the inner and the outer. And yet there seems to be a fragility in this beauty, that it can be so easily, you know, um, unbalanced, right? Uh, and then ultimately, I think there is this idea that beauty heals, that by looking at her, you know, the purity and the innocence that she projects is healing, right? It is inspiring. It is calming uh, and can create beauty itself, right? Now, one of the things your book does not talk about uh, in this, which I don't know why, is that this poem is beautiful, right? Anybody would love to have this poem written about them. But Byron wrote this um, as satire, the story goes that there was a young woman who had recently been widowed. Now, she had been married to a much older man. And at the time, and this is a tradition that, that lasted even throughout the Victorian era, that after your, your husband dies or something like that, you or your wife dies, you wear black. Everything you wear has to be black for a year. And then I think you can go to lavender as half mourning, right? And so this woman, I mean, her husband hadn't been dead for like, hardly any time at all and she goes to this party and she's wearing a black gown but it's got all these spangles that are glittering right and so Byron is pointing out her hypocrisy that she might be wearing black in mourning but she's not really mourning right uh, and so this is again him looking at these social institutions that require this and yet it's hypocritical right she wasn't in love with him um, it was an arranged marriage. Um, he might not have been in love with her, and yet she's forced to mourn like she cares that the person has died. And so this is maybe not only just um, pointing out her own hypocrisy, but also maybe pointing out the hypocrisy of a society that requires this, right? So again, she she isn't, you know, spending days in goodness. She's eager to get right out there partying and all of that, right? So, but again, if we just, if we divorce it, and this is the beauty of poetry, we don't have to consider those historical contexts of why the poet wrote it or in response. We can look at this poem outside of that and see that it is quite lovely and quite beautiful, right? Okay, next poem, uh, one of my favorites uh, by Byron. I actually know this one by heart. <laughs> Uh, there's another one called To Caroline, uh, number three. He wrote like three poems to Caroline. It's the third one that I also like. It's very similar to this, right? So this was written around 1816. And like um, She Walks in Beauty, and so we go no more rowing. These are really autobiographical poems. We believe that this poem was written after he had broken up or a woman had broken up with him that he'd been having an affair with. She was married. And then after they broke up, he found out that as she was sleeping with him, she was also having an affair with another person. And so that's why we feel this sense of betrayal here, right? So let's look at just the scansion. So our rhyme, you can see I've, I've marked it for you, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. It's very regular. This is written in dactylic trimeter. And I put trimeter in quotation marks because uh, we have these in jammed lines that actually when you look at the line, the first two lines actually complete kind of a, a one line of dactylic trimeter, right? Um, if you don't look at the, the each two lines as one continual line of rhyme and meter or rhythm and meter, um, then it doesn't follow into really any kind of known pattern, right? So dactylic is what I call, um, well, actually, I'm sorry, um, Dactylic is uh, emphasis and then two unemphasized, like when we two parted in silence and tears, right? Half broken, hearted to sever for years. Now this poem does have an irregular masculine ending where a dactyl ends in the feminine unemphasized one. We have a half foot at the end of each of these lines, but it's regular, right? But we can see when we two parted in silence and tears. And we don't count that half foot, so we've got three, that's trimeter, right? Uh, these are in jam lines, so you can see you read to the punctuation. So the uh, every other line pretty much 
um, a few occasions is in jam, right? We read around it. Uh, we have four octets, so you can see I've put a little line between the major stanzas, but within each octet, there are two separate parts. So we can say that these are divided into quatrains as well. So if you look at that first stanza, the first four lines establish an event that happened, and the second four lines show the consequences. So when we two parted in silence and tears, half broken hearted to sever for years, right? That's when he's talking about, right? And then the second part says, cold or pale grew thy cheek and cold, colder thy kiss. Truly that hour foretold sorrow to this, right? So you can see how each one of these octets is broken into two little sections, right? Excuse me. <coughs> Um, and this is a lyric. So in terms of uh, alliteration or figurative language, we have alliteration. And specifically, we have a lot of sibilance. And we can also see there was some sibilance in She Walks in Beauty. So sibilance is a type of alliteration where the rep repeated sound is the S, right? So silence and tears, right? And when we is also some alliteration, right? So we see that uh, throughout. Uh, there is apostrophe here. So apostrophe is uh, the literary uh, technique where you are speaking to someone or something that is absent from you. They're not right in front of you. Um, here he's talking to the lover who he has broken up with. And he's obviously not talking to her because at the end he says, how would I greet thee in silence and tears? So he can't say this to her. So he's saying it in a poem and he's writing it to her from afar. Uh, sometimes we also see poets write to things like moons or, or uh, Keats is going to write to the ode, the Grecian urn, right? So this is apostrophe. There's also aporia, A-P-O-R-I-A. And this is where we see doubt or uncertainty expressed by the speaker. And there's a lot of doubt and uncertainty through this. He says, you know, if I should meet thee after long years, how should I greet thee in silence and tears? It's like, I don't know what to say. Right, and so we do see um, this kind of doubt and uncertainty throughout. We do have metaphors. Um, uh, her name is like a knell, right? And he doesn't say it's like, are they named before me a knell to mine ear? That's around line 18. So he doesn't say it's like a, a knell. That would be simile. He says it's a knell to my ear. Knell is like the death toll of bells. So there's that's an example of uh, metaphor. And again, uh, similes. Um, the dew of the morning uh, felt like a warning, right? So there's our, a good example of simile. I accidentally repeated apostrophe, so ignore number six. Um, number seven is parallelism. And so parallelism is, again, if you think about parallel lines, they run equal to each other and they never cross. Parallelism in literature or writing is where you repeat certain things in equal uh, emphasis. So what's the parallelism here is when you think about at the beginning, when we parted in silence and tears, and at the end, we will meet in silence and tears. So that's an example of parallelism that we see here, right? He does have repetition in that he uses thee. I named thee before me. Why, you know, um, he repeats that name. Uh, we don't know who it is, right? And the setting is past and present. He's thinking about the past and he's thinking about the present. And he's actually even thinking about the future because he says, how would I greet thee if I should meet thee? So he's got this hypothetical, right? In terms of uh, themes, obviously, again, most romantic poems don't have really cryptic themes and uh, really complicated metaphor and simile. That's kind of one of the, the attributes of romantic literature that, again, anyone, common people without high advanced education can sit down and read these poems and understand them, right? So this is the pain of love after a breakup that's, that's betrayal, right? Uh, there's also forbidden love, right? You know, the gossips in society, they had to keep their love secret. So when we two parted in silence and tears, uh, you know, and she, he says, in secret we met, in silence I grieve. Um, so this was a forbidden love. They couldn't be open about it. And so nobody knows the pain that he's feeling because he's not able to talk about it. Though he does, as the poet, talk about it, but nobody really knows who it is, Right. And then I think the third thing here, and this is again one of those romantic themes, is the immediacy of memory. That your memory can take you back into that experience and relive it just as it was happening right there, right? He's remembering all of these things just like, he says, it feels like the warning of what I feel now, right? He is able to connect those things, right? So 
Uh, let's just read this one because, again, it's my favorite. When we two parted in silence and tears, half broken hearted to sever for years, pale grew thy cheek and cold, colder thy kiss. Truly that hour foretold sorrow to this. The dew of the morning sunk chill on my brow. It felt like the warning of what I feel now. Thy vows are all broken and light is thy fame. I hear thy name spoken and share in its shame. They name thee before me, a knell to my ears. A shudder comes o'er me. Why wert thou so dear? They know not I knew thee who knew thee too well. Long, long shall I rue thee too deeply to tell. In secret we met, in silence, I grieve that thy heart should forget, thy spirit deceive. If I should meet thee after long years, how would I greet thee? In silence and tears. Ah, that just gets you right to the heart, right? So again, we just see this person, he's, he's pondering this, he's uncertain and thinking about why were you so dear to me? Why do you have the power to hurt me this much, even after all of these years have passed? That's that aporia, right, that keeps coming in, right? Okay, so we'll go no more roving. About 1817, this is a year into his Italian exile. He's 29 years old. He's just had a rip-roaring couple of nights of drinking and carousing, and he's waking up and he's like, oh, <laughs> I can't do that anymore, right? Um, so here we have alternating rhyme, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, A, E, A, E. So he doesn't go to the F, right? E, F, E, F, but he repeats that A. But again, we see a real uh, alternating rhyme. This is iambic um, trimeter. Is it trimeter? Yeah, trimeter. But it's uh, an unusual. We have a lot of inversion here. We could say, so, so, yeah, we don't say, so we'll go, right, right. So it's like, so we'll go, no more a roving so late into the night. So it's the, the, the even number of lines have that clear iambic tr trimeter. The odd lines have um, not only an inversion at the beginning where we're usually starting with a dactyl, I mean a ga uh, um, anapest, ba -ba -bum, but we also have uh, that odd ending at the end, right? So we'll go no more a roving so late into the night Though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath and the soul wears out the breast. And the heart must pause to breathe and love itself have rest. Though the night was made for loving and the day returns too soon. Yet we'll go no more a roving by the light of the moon. Right, so it's a very uh, kind of a it's time for me to grow up and be an adult kind of poem, right? So our stanzas here, there are three quatrains, right? Quatrain is a, a lot, four lines. We do have a cesura, right? So a cesura is where there is a break in the regular meter. And the best example in this poem is, is number 12, by the light of the moon, right? If we think about the other last lines of the stanzas, and the moon be still as bright, and love itself have rest, by the light of of the moon, right? So there's an obvious break. Oftentimes we'll even see a comma in the middle of this. And so you have to have a pause there to kind of fill in the gap of whatever half foot is missing, right? Um, and this is a lyric as well. So in terms of figure language, we've got metaphor. Um, the sword outreads the sheath. So the sword is a metaphor for something. It could be a penis, right? Uh, you know, that's a, oftentimes a sword and a sheath, right? Um, but again, we, we do have a metaphor there. We have apostrophe. He's talking to whoever this wheel is, is no, not in front of him, right? Uh, metonymy. Uh, metonymy is where you speak of something, but you only name it by a part of its whole, right? So a really good example of that is like a sword. Sometimes we'll call a sword a blade. A blade is part of a whole sword, but it's only part, but sometimes we'll say the, the sword, right? Um, and so when he says um, the heart must pause to breathe, Right? or the heart be still as loving. These, you know, you don't love with just your heart. You love with everything you are. But sometimes we just identify it as the heart, right? Um, and so, again, I think there's a little metonymy there. And then we do have assonance. So assonance is, is, sim is similar to alliteration, uh, whereas it is a repetition of sounds, but it's a repetition of vowel sounds. So if you look at that first line, 
so will go no more a roving. That O is, is very prevalent. And again, it's throughout. Um, so that's assonance, right? And so in terms of um, themes, we can see that, again, this is kind of a, a, a saying goodbye to youth and kind of a growing old, an, a, an acknowledgement of that kind of poem. Um, you know, we might say, is there regret here or is it weariness? I think when we know about this poem, um, we link it to a letter that Byron wrote to a friend that just talks about, you know, I've just got up and I'm just not able to get up and go all night and blah, 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 right? And he talks about what he's been doing. And then this poem is written very similar, very soon around the same time. And so that's why we think this is a reflection of that aspect. And in that letter, he, he reflects not so much regret as just weariness. He's just tired of it all. He's tired of the choices that he's been making, of the life that he's been leading. <coughs> and I think there is an aspect of regret. So I think we could see both of that, right? One of the other themes here is that the, the night is a time for inhibit, uninhibited action versus the day is when you act soberly and responsibly, right? So that's a theme that I think is consistent in poetry. And then mutability is another thing, that his body changes, but, the na but nature and love don't, right? Because he says, and then he says, though the night was made for loving, right? So that stays the same, and the day returns too soon, right? Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's at the beginning up here. Though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. So this is love and nature. They're the same. They've not changed here. Mutability um, is a quality of changing, right? So we think of mutation, right? He says, but humans are mutable. Humans change, right, physically, right? And maybe mentally, though emotionally we can still be the same in terms of how we love, right? And so I think that's another aspect here. And then finally, the spirit is willing, but the body isn't able is definitely one of the, the kind of messages that are coming out of here, right? Uh, and so it's, it's kind of a sad, it's an end of an era kind of poem, right? Okay, so this is the poem that isn't in your book that I asked you to read online, The Destruction of Sennacherib. This is also published in the Hebrew Melodies, along with She Walks in Beauty. We think it was written about 1815. Um, so here we have uh, couplets as the rhyming, A-A-B-B-C-C, -C, right? Uh, our meter is anapestic tetrameter. So anapestic is, you know, if the iambic is the heartbeat, anapestic is the horse gallop. Bum, 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 right? Um, and this is one of my favorite poems because the use of such a rigid, regular meter and rhyme, where every line is in stop, there is a punctuation at the end of the line, and yet it has such vibrancy and life, and it doesn't get into a real sing-songy thing, right? So I really love it for the imagery and the way he masterfully uses rhyme and meter here to tell this story. It's not like sometimes in the neoclassical era where they're forced to use very strict rules, you see them writing things and they and they fit into it, but it doesn't sound natural. This actually does. He has managed to, to choose the right words in the right order to tell this story in a way that totally makes sense telling it like this, right? So the Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming and purple and gold and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rose nightly on deep Galilee. Like the leaves of the forest when summer is green, that host with their banners at sunset were seen. Like the leaves of the forest when autumn hath blown, the host on that morrow lay withered and strown. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed. And the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill, and their hearts but once heaved and forever grew still. And there lay the steed with his nostril all wide, but through it there rolled not the breath of his pride. And the foam of his gasping lay white on the turf, as cold as the spray of the rock-beating surf. And there lay the rider, distorted and pale, with the dew on his brow and the rust on his mail. And the tents were all silent, and banners alone, the lances unlifted, the trumpet unblown. And the widows of Asher are loud in their wail, and the idols are broke in the temple of Baal, and the might of the Gentile unsmote by the sword hath melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. Oh, that's such a great poem, right? If only I could write like Byron, right? Um, so this is the backstory. Again, this is a, a biblical event, right? Sennacherib was an Assyrian leader, and this is where, um, you know, the Assyrians came down and 
the the Jewish the Hebrew forces quite uh, outnumbered managed to defeat them right this poem you can see I say it starts in medius res it kind of starts in the beginning like, like right in the middle of everything right um, we have six quatrains as our stanzas and again we have all in stopped lines there's a punctuation mark that ends each one well, we have a uh, metaphor right um, and we have simile, we have lots of simile, right? Like the leaves of the forest, like um, uh, there's another one, like a wolf on the fold, right? Um, and we do see a um, metaphor, um, where is one? I can't think of where I've marked it. I'll probably see it here in a little bit. Um, personification, so the angel of death is personified as having some kind of, like, a, like spread his wings, right? And they saying that it's a he, right? So that's personification when you give human quality to something that is uh, not human or, or actually maybe even inanimate. Uh, there is symbolism, right? God's power and the ease in which he uses it. Um, so the, the angel of death is the symbol of that power. Uh, there is irony. The, the, you know, this has got a lot of hubris in it. The Assyrians, they're, they're like a wolf on the fold, right? They're coming down. They're going to smite everything. And yet God, just so easily, without even a sword, right? That's the thing. It's the angel breathes in their face, and they just die, right? It looks like of natural causes. So at the end, it was like they're unsmote by the sword. No sword has ever been able to touch them, but God just glances, melts them like snow, right? Um, and so that's kind of, there's irony there. We have metonymy. So again, remember metonymy is where a part of something represents its whole. So Sennacherib is kind of equal to the Assyrians. So the destruction of Sennacherib is the destruction of the Assyrians. Uh, there is allusion. So this is making allusion to the biblical story. Uh, allusion is where you're referring to historical events or people or things uh, and not that are outside of the poem, right? So he's alluding to this story. And then synecdoche, very similar to metonymy, and that something is replacing uh, something else in terms of how you refer to it. But whereas metonymy is about, I'm only calling something by a part of who it is, right? Synecdoche is, about, is calling somebody or something by something that is associated with it, right? So if I call a businessman a suit, right, that's synecdoche because businessmen usually wear suits, right? If I say, if I refer to the king as the crown, that's synecdoche because the crown is an organically part of the king it's something that is associated with being king right so we do have synecdoche i think in the tents the tents were all silent the tents are silent because there's nobody in there and so they're they're standing in for kind of like all of the different people that are supposed to be there right um and so i've again i've also again just pointed out things like in that second stanza we see mortality right we see this abrupt shift and shift shift in time so summer, you know, we use the, the season sometimes to represent the stages of life. So spring is youth, summer is adulthood, autumn is kind of um, early senior area, and then de uh, winter is often old age, close to death, right? So here he says, though they are, at first they're like summer, right? They're, they're in full bloom, you know, at, at, during uh, that day, right, um, on, the, on the morning, right? they're dead, right? They're like the autumn leaves that have withered up and die. So this, you know, reflects mortality, right? Um, and that last stanza, again, the widows of Asher. Asher is the Assyrian capital. Uh, and it says, the idols are broke in the temple of Baal, so God is greater than armies and other gods, right? So their God wasn't able to protect them and their swords aren't able to protect them. So God is greater than all of that. So we can say here are themes, God's omnipotence, right? He stopped the Assyrian victory with just divine intervention, mortality, right? Uh, the details of the death juxtaposed uh, triumph of the faithful with the sobering and pitiful reality that we all die. So, um, and then hubris versus kind of the underdog, right? The faithful are rewarded, um, the proud are brought low. And you can see I kind of made it, if you could read my writing, there's a message to maybe British leaders in this. So like, why was he writing this poem? Well, if you think about what the romantics were doing, we're trying to bring about social change and equality. And this might be a cautionary tale to these kings and arist aristocrats who think that they've got all the, po the power, they've never been defeated, and that, you know, the rabble can't, uh, can't you know, make them change. They're, they're not a danger to them. He's drawing on, he's alluding to this famous story, perhaps, to remind them that 
if it's God's will and God is for justice, then nobody is untouchable, All right? That's kind of maybe the one of the takeaways to stay, take out of this, other than, of course, it's just an awesome poem. Read it out loud. Read the poems out loud. Get them in your mouth. Uh, feel the rhythm and the rhyme and all those wonderful words that they're choosing. I think that's just a really great way to, uh, you know, I'm, I, I admit uh, at least once a year I read out loud um, Twelfth Night by Shakespeare. It's my favorite comedy by Shakespeare, and I just like to say it out loud, right? Um, and again, I many of these poems I have uh, down by heart because I like to I like them so much. I want to be able to remember them no matter what. So again, be t be expressing these things out loud. Um, it, it gives you a different way of of kind of feeling the poem because you're organically experiencing it as opposed to just with your eyes. Okay, so our next video will be about uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley. So see you then.